G'day and welcome back to the Talking Leadership Podcast Series. Thanks for joining me again. Today's guest is an executive coach, business accelerator, keynote speaker with Kim Karen Consulting. I welcome to the podcast Dr. Libby Kim Karen and initially started the conversation by asking her about what drove her to this thing called leadership and it's quite an interesting discussion. Libby is quite open about the incident that brought things to a head for her and it explains a lot about her perspective on leadership which is quite an interesting one but enough of me talking I'll hand over to Libby and hope you enjoy the podcast. Hi, Eric. Thank you for having me. Very good. Thank you. Listen, we did some prep before we started the podcast and I want to and I want to use this as a lead into the first question. How did you get into the leadership pathway that you got to? So give me your story in 200 words or less if you could. <laughs> good luck. Good yeah. Luck. <laughs> Just we, cut we me t- off. Just get the field <laughs> We, we talked about behavior and that you you're a, you're a student of of the human the human mind and why we behave the way that we behave I want you to if you can explain where you think your love of psychology came from and how do you think that links to your love of looking at leadership and in particular I know that you deal with entrepreneurs and you do train c-suite executives so it looks like you do a lot of different things and I, I'm tr- struggling to imagine where you get time to sleep let alone breathe <laughs> doing this stuff so let's go for that first question if we can and sure. yeah how did you get to where you are today mate it was a a, a childhood based on watching my parents you know when you see dysfunction and you see patterns and you watch people relentlessly sabotage themselves and they had a very stormy marriage and I remember being that kid like peeking through your fingers watching it break down and I just developed this innate fascination with like why do people do what they do why are they doing this why are they running I can hear it why can't they hear it I can see it why can't they see it and it just it switched on this light bulb of like there isn't a there isn't a right way to live life there's just what you know you only know what you know and so depending on how you're brought up depending on what references you've got around you you see different things and nowhere is that more evident than with leadership (laughs) you know you lead in the way that you've been taught to lead and you you teach others to do the same and it becomes this self-fulfilling prophecy where cultures can be created overnight just by dint of some very loud dominant voices and so I I grew up just really fascinated with people and I I tripped and fell and ended up in the city of London and I I was by 26 director level in my own business there Um, I just sort of was an accidental entrepreneur and as a result I was I was helping some of the big law firms and some of the big banks and the biggest thing that kept coming up was people problems people problems people problems and it's that old adage right you got people you got problems I was helping them with recruitment and retention and you know I just I, I began to get really curious as to why is this happening so I, I found and followed Tony Robbins I'm sure many of you out there will have will have heard of Tony Robbins absolute guru of the last 20 years um, when he dies he'll be remembered as an Einstein but for now he's a six foot six American with bright white teeth so you know he is looked down on by some scientific communities but actually this guy's done an awful lot of research into humans and so I was I was following him and I was in a, a big seminar when 9-11 happened and that that sort of event really forces you to shine a light on your own experiences and to really look deeply into am I where I should be in the world am I doing what I should be because life is very short right a lot of us are in that state now with COVID of realizing life is very short and can be made even shorter so I, I did a, a massive reinvention and I took myself off to uni to retrain and and the thing that I decided I wanted to do at that stage was actually be a vet because this this love for animals was something I'd always had so I, I went towards the veterinary career but while I was there Cambridge University they're absolute bastards they make you do an extra degree just for the fun of it while you're there so I was there and I had to pick a subject and what came out wasn't animals and I was really surprised at that because I was doing this big reinvention but the degree that I chose to do was behavior and so I did this degree in neural mechanisms of behavior and it was like a massive punch in the gut awareness of oh my god this really inspires me but by then I was on the on the path to being a vet so I was like and never mind carry on so I <laughs> carried on being a vet and and I was I was happy I was I was being a vet for a good five years and I, I still remember the day when that all changed because I was in my car driving home after a very long shift of mending broken animals and I and there were some temporary traffic lights at the top of this hill and I still remember the song that was on the radio and I pulled up and it was dark November night 7 p.m. and I stopped at these traffic lights and I was gazing around and then bang up the backside got hit by a car didn't know the lights were there and this woman tanked into me at full speed it trashed my neck my vertebrae c2 to c6 crushed and i suddenly couldn't do surgery anymore 
So in a moment, all of that destiny, all of that 10 years of working towards this goal was gone, like wiped out in an instant. And so I had to reinvent myself. I had to, again, I had to dig deep and find what it is that matters to me. Came out as people, reformatted what I was doing. I took my old business consultancy skills, married them up. With my knowledge of the veterinary industry, I became a consultant helping vets practices to grow. And so that was, the, that was my feet on the path to being a leader in this field and, and leading businesses. Um, I've since evolved through a couple of iterations of that. And I now run my own consultancy, helping the smaller guys, helping, helping the entrepreneurs, helping the solopreneurs, helping females get free of the nine to five and, and beginning to build their own course towards doing something other than just a day job. Wow, that's... It's an amazing summary. There's so much I could ask out of that, but we'll stick to the script, but I will come back to a couple of things you mentioned there. So defining leadership now, this this is a new question I'm, I'm asking my guests, and I'm sure you're going to have a definition because I think everyone has a definition and, and yeah. um, I've, I've moved away in my own mind from what is the most right, if there is a most right definition or is one definition better than another. I think from what I'm seeing in the workplace and the people that I'm talking to, your situation and the context in which you work can sometimes have some pressures around how you define the topic. So you've, you've had some life experience and it sounds like you've had some some blows that you've recovered from, significant ones. Based on all that and the people you've seen, the, the professionals that you've interacted with, the people you've trained, how do you define leadership? I've just said a lot of words, so I'm going to give you three. <laughs> so this is my take home. If anyone wants to take one thing from this chat, you need to transform people people you need to inspire them and you need to empower them that in a nutshell is what leadership is leadership I've obviously got my system I've got a five pillars of leadership training that I do called transformational leadership um, I'm not going to go through that here because I, I, I don't want to teach the the tool I want to teach the why the why is bigger than the tool right and when we know the why the tool becomes really simple but there's a difference between leadership and management. Management is management of things. Leadership is leading people. So you imagine you're, you're climbing a mountain and it's a, there's a blizzard and you are the person in charge of getting that team up that mountain through this blizzard to safety. Your job is to deliver that team to safety. Now, you can do this in two ways. You can use your magnetism. You can attract them with you. Is it easier to do that and lead from the front and have them follow you? Or do you need to get behind each person and individually push each one up that hill? Which one's going to take you more effort? Which one is going to create more of a feeling of team? Which one's going to empower them? the most and which one's going to inspire them the most obviously obviously it's that attraction if you think of it like magnets you know physics tells us and we can learn a lot from science when it comes to leadership physics tells us the force between the attraction ends of two magnets is greater than the force if you reverse them and, and their repulsion repulsion is a weaker force attraction is way stronger and things go click and move into place and when you inspire people the word inspire comes from the latin to inflame to blow into it's very different than motivating motivating is carrot and stick like whipping them along and dangling rewards and that only lasts so long and it's extrinsic inspiration is intrinsic inspiration comes from within and if each team member is inspired as a leader, your job becomes completely different and leading that team to safety becomes fun because you are also in charge of your destiny and theirs. They are in charge of their destiny. They need to have the sense of autonomy for them to feel comfortable. The old models of, of leadership, which now many are rebelling against. I don't know if any of you have seen the anti-work thread on Reddit. It's fascinating watching this revolution happening. This resignation revolution is happening right now. Go and have a read. If you haven't read it, it's, it's absolutely compelling for a behavioural geek like me. But people are rejecting this old top-down command and control methodology. And they're beginning to look for this, who can I trust? Who, who will inspire me? Who can I trust with my journey through this pathway? So leadership for me has come right back down, really distilled down to this transform, inspire, empower. Yeah, thank you for that. I, I, I'm constantly fascinated and, and I learn from all of these discussions because, because I have my own biases, I guess, and I have a definition of leadership that is, is a little different to yours. But I think at the core of what you've just said is something that should drive most people is you want, you would hope leaders want people that are on the journey to achieve a vision or goal, whatever those things might be from that internal locus of control instead of something that's external to you. And 
that delineation, that split is very important. And I hadn't given that a lot of thought because you hear a lot of training packages and there's lots of them that talk about how do you motivate to get somewhere? And yeah. If you follow your thinking to its logical conclusion, the motivating angle has has a use-by date and is not necessarily geared for longevity. Whereas if you're talking about inspiring people, you're you're talking something very different. But again, the, the assumptions there is that the leader has the knowledge, skills and abilities to put a narrative together that gets you inspired. Because if, if there's one thing I'm learning as I, I go through this journey myself, and you talked about taking a journey or this pathway that I'm on myself, I think the, the building a narrative and selling a, a proposition, a, a business case, whatever you want to call it, uh, that's becoming more important not less important now it's it's nuanced and it will differ between industries but it's eminently fascinating what what people will take away from what you're talking about and inspiration is a is a not not a loaded term i think it it's an underused term because it if you unpack what inspiration can mean it can mean lots of different things and um, i guess it's where do you draw the boundaries on something and the entrepreneurs that i've spoken to as soon as i've ever used the word boundary they go they it's, it's like it's a uh, it's like it's their kryptonite. They go, mate, don't talk about boundaries. Talk about possibilities. Talk about other ways of looking at the world. Don't don't put yourself in a neat little box. And mm. it's taken me a long while to be able to move a little bit in my thinking and go, well, maybe there isn't static definitions. Maybe it needs to morph over time. And if we've learned anything through COVID, and I think that's what you were alluding to before, and, and jump in and correct me if I'm wrong here, that our assumptions on lots of different things are changing. Does that ring it's, true for you? It's been an amazing catalyst for change in a way that nobody could have predicted. You know, the fact that we're here having this conversation across continents, across the world, that is now normalised. That used to be very odd. That used to be a very exotic thing to do. I've now got clients in I've got clients in Peru, I've got clients in Hong Kong, I've got clients in Singapore, I've got clients in Switzerland, I've got Australian, American, you know, there are no boundaries. The boundaries have shifted. And this digital revolution, I'm a partner with the Entrepreneurs Institute. Um, Roger Hamilton's a really amazing thinker who I would urge anyone to go and have a look at. I do regular calls with them called Tame Your Brain uh, every month to lead entrepreneurs forward because what we have to do is shift the paradigm. And that's really difficult. Humans don't do that very well. Humans don't like change. The human brain resists it because we still run on this very old fashioned wiring, which is about, is it a saber toothed tiger? You know, am I about to die? And so our wiring kicks in to tell us anything new is a danger, is a threat. And so there will be a large percentage of the population that won't be able to think outside the box yet. And I use the word yet because eventually, just like with the internet invention, suddenly it's the thing but for the years the daily mail were running articles going it's a fad it will die out but i'll, I'll just come on to a point that you made eric that's really important about this thing about inspiration being an internal locus of control and that's so important because you don't need external references when you have faith in your vision now the thing with leading other people is that if you don't have a shared vision it's incredibly difficult to get anything other than just motivation just an external because it's like a team of huskies when the huskies are pulling in different directions a sledge goes nowhere you align them you pull them into alignment you harness them towards a direction like a, a vector has magnitude and direction right as soon as you pull things towards the same direction then you get traction then you get movement and anything based so i use a, a pyramid it's the four v's so you must have shared vision shared values shared voice and in the middle of that is the virtues the daily virtues that play out and this is something that I coach uh, uh, loads of different layers of, of C-suites to solopreneurs on. But unless you've got a shared vision with those people that you're working with and alongside, the sledge goes nowhere. You have to have a common why. And I, I said, starting with the why, at the, at the beginning of this, everything is that. Start with why piece. Simon Sinek's a great voice on this. If you guys haven't come across him, go look up. There's a three-minute video on YouTube, which is fascinating. But that why is the driving, that's the rocket fuel. When you've got that shared why, suddenly everything else falls into position. Being able to trigger 
that the outside of the box thinking and to move away from looking at ambiguity or change as something to be feared is an issue. And it's one thing that I'm, um, as a extremely early career researcher, is something that fascinates me that there are, and we could have arguments about this, and I'm not intending to have an argument with you or a discussion on this particular issue, but it's worth bringing up that there are different views on what are the key uh, key capabilities that leaders should have. And you could you, you could identify hundreds of them, but I, I have a couple in my own mind that I think are so fundamentally important. You can have all of the others and nothing's going to move forward. And those two for me are strategic thinking and foresight. You may not agree, just for me, but the, the thing that I think has been missing in the way I'm conceptualizing it and what the, the vista of leadership is to add a third element. And I can't move away from this idea that the leaders and entrepreneurs of the world now and those that are on the come up those that can deal with ambiguity and change and understand what it means are going to be more successful than yeah. those that don't. I'm not saying that other ones that don't won't be successful, but I think if the an inability to pivot, an inability to drop a strategic plan that took you a year to write and maybe think under current conditions, we need to have a plan that is uh, malleable is not standard business practice. And I, I think there's still a massive resistance to, if we don't have the strategic plan, what the hell are we doing? We need to find a new language for what strategic planning and strategic thinking will look like into the future. And I think that thinking was happening for quite some time. And it, it you know, unfortunately, it took a pandemic for people to start um, asking some uh, more fundamental questions about what that might mean in the world of work. Now, I, again, I have to preface this because I've been pulled up on this a few times I'll offline and I'm going to say this now with as much humility as, as I can as I could muster here I'm sharing opinions and I'm sharing things that are contestable and for anyone who wants to contest them please do and I, I think you would agree that in the world of ideas you need to be able to challenge each other and um, I, I would suggest to you what you've brought up is is in some ways difficult to challenge because if you've never engaged with it, people go, oh, what do you, what do, what are they what are they talking about? Um, inspiration. What does that mean for me? Well, if you don't understand what's being proposed, it doesn't mean it doesn't have value, and it means you choose to ignore it. And if you dig into the reasons why people choose to ignore a different way to think, that exposes all sorts of crap that has got you thinking the way that you're thinking. And this has been coming at me for quite some time with the guests that I've been speaking to, because once you sift out the peripheral stuff, I think what you're all saying to me is you need to rethink maybe what your thinking is and bring in um, some and some new assumptions and, and maybe yeah. test those things. Um, and I'm going to back you up. I'm not going to contradict you. I'm going to absolutely back you up, Eric, because there is science around this. There is data. And that is all based on the brain. Everything I do comes back to the brain. I'm a very much a purist in that. And that's why my programs are all titled Tame Your Brain, because it is like a crazy wild animal that left to itself when we run our old neurology, which let's be honest, is, is a bit out of date. You know, we have these amazing quick trigger reactions when we're under threat. And so it's really helpful if what you're faced with is a saber toothed tiger that your stomach knots into a ball and all the blood flow diverts from it and you stop digesting your food because there's no point digesting your food if you're about to die. It's really helpful if your calf muscles constrict and blood rushes there and you get massive amounts of ATP in your calf muscles and they get really tight so that you can run fast if you're about to die. You know, all these things make sense. Your field of vision narrows. You stop your creative thinking because there's no point thinking long-term strategic goals if you want to see a tiger leaping at you. Your depth of field increases. All of these responses are innate, pre-programmed and really sensible if it's a saber-toothed tiger. Unfortunately, if it's a management challenge, difficult conversation with an employee, you know, if it's a driving test, if it's a GCSE exam, none of those things give that an appropriate response frame. And so we're running outdated software for modern times. The trouble is our brain takes a long time to catch up. Our brain is way behind. And there's this little part of your brain particularly called the amygdala. It's part, and for those of you not brain geeks, stop listening now. The amygdala is what does all this. And it's like a sentry on, on the bow of the ship. And it's standing there, literally scanning the horizon, going, look out, rocks, polar bears. You know, it's calling out change. It's calling out, because it, it wants nothing more than to keep you safe. And being safe means stay in that harbour. Being safe, but a ship's got to sail, right? You've got to leave that harbour. You've got to take risks. And exactly what you said about being comfortable with 
risk is part of this duality and especially for entrepreneurs you know you've got to really especially in this digital revolution you've got to come out your box you've got to embrace risk you've got to move towards risk and therefore you've got to get really good at managing anxiety and managing threat because that is what your brain is going to tell you it is there is a there is a balance you know every time we up our challenge level as soon as we move out of our flow state and flow is something i spend a lot of time talking about as soon as we move out of our flow state when the challenge is too high for the skill set you've got you move into anxiety the opposite is also true when your skill set is too high for the challenge you've got you zoom into boredom flow is the beautiful balance between those things where the challenge matches your skill and then when you stay in flow you get into peak productivity so i'm a peak performance consultant i look at how to build a high performing team and it is that balance between challenge and skill as you up skill you should also up challenge so that you don't get bored as you up challenge you should also up skill so that you don't live in anxiety forever and that's where coaches come in that's what we do is we help we hold you by the hand and lead you through that upskilling by walking the path one step ahead of you by leading up that mountain to make sure that you move safely into that zone of flow again and then you can move back into peak productivity Libby, can I ask, And because you mentioned your definition of leadership, which is fairly straightforward, are there any in your travels, and I'm looking for maybe a definition here, I think, what are the leader capabilities that underpin those three areas in your definition of leadership? Can you share them with us? Sure. This is my five pillars. Um, I do this talk on conference stages around the world. Um, It's a really basic set of rules. The first is, I've already mentioned, leadership, not management. You are not managing things. You are leading people. You have to start with an intrinsic understanding. These are not things. These are people. Everyone sees the world through their own filters. Everyone is in this for themselves. And as soon as you start to manage people like they're a thing, you're going to lose the game. You have to remember these are people with their own agendas and their own dialed in choices in life. And unless you dial in with those, so the second pillar of these is not sympathy, but empathy. Unless you dial in with feeling what they're feeling, knowing what they're knowing, doing what they're doing, we have to understand that when we come at it with sympathy, oh, I'm sorry for how you feel. That's very different than coming at it from empathy. Right. I know how you feel. I'm feeling it too. Empathy is one of the key criteria of leadership. Unless you can actually empathize with somebody else's position towards that shared vision, you are going to lose the game. I teach a methodology called the Big Cat Business Brain. There are basically four types of neurology. And one of the biggest things to understand is what is somebody's primary question. So you might be the cheetah brain. They wake up with three brilliant ideas in the shower every morning. They follow through precisely none of them because they get distracted and they're off. You know, cheetahs are 70 miles an hour or stop, right? They're either go, go, go after that gazelle or they're flat on their back in the sun. So cheetah brains, they're key word is what what's now what's next they want to speak to you in what they won't see a problem till it's on fire because they're so high level thinking they're already thinking six months down the line these guys make great entrepreneurs to start with unless they have a team around them they fall apart very fast you might be the lion brain lions are more about the people they live together hunt together sleep together so lions are all about the who their keyword is who who's on my team who are you what's your story they talk about what you did at the weekend because they genuinely care they know everybody's birthday they organize the leaving drinks you know these are dialed into the relationships so unless you're asking them the question of who can do this they won't be interested if you're talking about just the what then we've got our leopard brain leopards sit in their tree they watch and they wait because they just feel they're they're kinesthetic so whereas the lines are visual the the, the, the lines are an auditory the cheetahs are visual these guys are kinesthetic they feel so they feel things very deeply and that takes some time to make a decision because they always want one more bit of information and they want everything to be fair i get the feeling you've got quite a lot of leopard about you eric and you want you want everything to be fair everything needs to be fair right don't break the contract don't not do what you said you were going to do you know do things on time do what you said you're going to do because that's what we said so you're all about contract consistency context and connection so you're building your world around that question of where by who by when is your main thing where's it going to happen when's it going to happen timing is really important to these guys and if it doesn't feel right you will not be sold to you will not be pushed (laughs) you will foot down you'll absolutely just be like flat no and people will get very frustrated if they don't understand that about you because don't change the deal and you hate lack of information flow you hate a lack of knowledge about what's happening next and if something's unfair it will rankle with you for years you will carry that pack around with you right and (laughs) so this is something to understand about neurology is how we respond to events around us the final type of brain is a tiger the mighty tiger pads silently through the forest i think you've got an element of this too no one's one of these everyone's got a blend 
ascend, but usually we're single dominant or double dominant. The tiger is steady progress towards the goal. They're all about data analysis. They're risk averse. They analyze the hell out of everything. They zoom right in and they're all about show me the data, show me the facts. Again, these guys won't be sold to either. They are the last to buy because they're at the back of the room with their arms folded going. So any tigers listening now are still like this with me. They're still rubbing their chin going, hmm, is she really talking nonsense or is this logic? And they will analyze the hell out of everything because that's what they care about. They don't care about people, their process over people. So we can look at these different neurology types and their key word is how by the way. Well, how's that going to work? So like Cheetah will say, let's have a barbecue. I've got a brilliant idea. We'll have a barbecue because they're all about the what. The lion will say, brilliant. I'll invite everyone I've ever met. We'll do karaoke. I'll make cocktails. I've not seen them for three years, but let's get them around now. And then the leopards, they're going, yes, but have we got enough chairs? What about the vegans? Who's? I'll make a spreadsheet. Hang on. I'll do a list. And they pull out their clipboard. And then the tiger comes in and goes, do you know it's going to rain at three? Have you even got a gazebo? You know, they're all about the how. None of these is wrong. They're all just responding to their primary question. They're all just talking to what's important to them. And if as a leader, you don't recognize what's important to them, you will judge that lion for not being a tiger. And you will, And if you're a tiger brain going across grid, this is the hardest leap for a leader. If you're a tiger brain and you're all about the data, you'll call it the fluffy stuff. When the lion says to you, oh yeah, but Mary wasn't invited. She's feeling really bad. You need to go and talk to her. You'd be like, what the, Jesus, get over yourself. So tiger brains can be really scathing of lions. Lions cannot understand the process being more important than the people because to them people always come first. Cheetahs are speaking so fast they don't hear what anyone else is saying and leopard is sitting behind going why am I not quick enough? So this understanding the question people ask is the principles of flow. So I'm a, I'm a massive fan of flow. Um, I'm a flow consultant. I'm a peak performance consultant because as soon as you understand these neurologies you start to understand why people do what they do and that is the gold. You've probably got me spot on more. I think as I've aged, the people element has become a lot more important to me. Family matters a lot and how other people feel about the consequences of the things that I do are becoming more important. I can attribute that to the, the good people I have around me, my relationships, but uh, in some ways it's raising kids. That's been a big help. If you were talking to me 20 odd years ago before kids, it, it was about the me. I didn't give a crap about other people it was about my journey and uh i i often find myself having to stop going when you look at the younger generations on the come up you think that they're all about themselves but you kind of forget that you did that in a different way yourself and you were being judged in the same way by those that were already where you're trying to get to everything you said makes a lot of sense particularly the the need for people to say well if you don't do things my way why aren't you doing things my way and empathy is about being able to look at the world from other people's point of view and it requires an ability to put aside your own shit and be able to take on the concerns of others. And uh, I don't think that's easily done. Some I've met some really good leaders that I think their empathy level is non-existent because they know how to play the game. But if you really look at, are they being empathetic? I don't think that's there. And you talk about neurologies. I, I was thinking, when does it become a neurosis? When, when do these things become toxic? And I think it's all part of the, when you push something to an extreme, if you, the only thing that drives you in, your, in the world of work is data and knowledge, it's to the exclusion of some other important stuff. And I think in some ways, and this, this is just the best leaders that I've encountered balance those things and recognize when something is lacking. And not just leaders in general, I think the entrepreneurs can identify that. And when you said before that certain entrepreneurs, the ones that are the big, big ideas thinkers need people around them to be able to sustain long term, that makes a lot of sense to me. Yeah, yeah, because an entrepreneur, some of the ones I've spoken to, and maybe you can back me on this, I'm, this is definitely, I'm, I'm trying to get some data in, in terms of conversations that I'm having is the more agile entrepreneurs identify their skill gaps and fill those with people that can do the thing they need to do. The entrepreneur yeah. that will probably burn out tries to do it all and doesn't yeah. do it well. And you and can't, then, yeah. and you can't. And the, the trouble with doing it all, it's not that you can't do it. I'll be really clear on this one because this is a real misconception of what flow is about. We can all do everything. We can all do everything. Some things will just exhaust you. 
So I can do a spreadsheet. However, it makes me want to poke my eyes out with a spoon. So I employ people to do my taxes. I employ people to do my spreadsheets. I've got two VAs around the world that work in different time zones to back me up. Because if I do that myself, I will exhaust myself and be less effective at the stuff that is my zone of genius, which is talking to people. That's my job. I'm really good at talking to people. I talk all day as my kids describe it. And that is my job. And I do that really well. If I have to do all the admin and all of those leopard tasks and the tiger tasks, because as you probably noticed, I'm very high cheetah brain, high lion brain. I'm all about the big energy, the big why, come on, let's go. And, and that is where I live. If I have to zoom into those tasks, I will end up, I've, I've got a very small gas tank for those. So I will end up exhausted, burnt out, and I won't love the job anymore. The point of flow is about staying in your zone of genius and doing it really well. That makes you peak productive. And it's that Pareto principle. It's that 80-20 rule. You can get to 80% productivity when you stay in that stuff that's easy for you. The trouble with school reports is they're the opposite of that. You know, you're crap at maths, go and do more maths. Flow is like coming away from that and saying, you're crap at maths, employ somebody as soon as you can to do all your maths and you stay around here. You do this. So just to make it really clear, you know, I've got a vet degree from Cambridge University. That's quite a steely task. That's quite a tiger brain. That's all about data. That's all about pharmacokinetics. I could do that, but it nearly killed me. Like it drained me. So I could do that, but should I? That's the key criteria. And when we stay in that thing that thrills us, that is what we are naturally gifted at, which is something that we are able to do fluidly. That's what flow means, is moving with current, moving in stream flow. Life gets fun. It gets you move with grace and ease. It stops feeling like wading through treacle. <laughs> and that's the magic source, is find that thing which makes you feel like, this is fun. I can do this. Can I really call this work? That's when you're in your zone. <laughs> yeah, I'm hearing what you're saying. Libby, let me ask you something. And this, this is, um, I'm, I'm going to, I think we're going to have fun with this particular question. It's the nature versus nurture question. Are leaders born or are they made? Oh, love that one. Love that one. I like to think of this in two ways. You are that small child watching your parents' dysfunctional marriage fall apart in front of your eyes. That's one part of you. Then there's what you do about it. There's what you do about it. So we all have formative experiences. We form our model of the world, blokes roughly between the age of seven to nine, females roughly between six to eight. There's events that happen that make you form assumptions. And that is the world does this, people are this, people react to me like this. You can probably think back, Eric, and you can probably remember an event that formed your belief about the world because of something that happened to you roughly around that age. Sometimes it's starting a new school. Sometimes it's an event when a teacher picked on you in class. Sometimes it's something where there was a moment where someone told you you weren't telling the truth and you knew you were. Those stick. They are sticky events. And when we have sticky events, it's like a post-it note goes on the wall of your brain and you keep referencing back to it. You become this human Google. And this is why it's that lovely thing about what you believe is what you see. We filter the world around us all the time. Believing is seeing. It's not the other way around. What you believe you then find reference for. It's called confirmational bias. And whatever we believe in our soul and our heart is what we then see reference for in the world around us. So that's element one. But then there's what you do about it. So I could have let that car crash be my defining moment. I could have stayed in the wheelchair I ended up in. I could have stayed in that zone of being the victim. Life happens to me. When you come from victim mode of life happens to me, as opposed to the empowerment mode. So my third word for leadership is that empowerment. And you have to start by empowering yourself. And so what you do to make yourself the best leader is you get a coach, you read all the books, you go out there and study what it takes to be a great leader. Because the way I view my life is I'm becoming my rocking chair memory of myself. Every day I live with intentionality so that I can look back on this younger version of me and be proud of who I am. I'm history in the making. And if I'm not living to my highest standard, if I'm not holding myself to account by how I'll judge myself, I'm doing something wrong. So every day that I wake up and I get out of bed and I start my moves through the world, it's because I know that one day I'll look back on this day and I will have an opinion on it. So in, in that sense, leadership is very much what you do. It's this be, do, have continuum. You want to have something at the end of it. So you want to lose weight, right? There's certain doings you have to do along the way. But there's a being that you have to be to do the doings to get the having. And that being that who am I? I know that I want to be a legacy for my children. I want to be a role model for other women around the world. I want to be leading entrepreneurs. That's my version of leadership is walking with intentionality every single day of my life. And that's a mixture of gratitude and desire. Desire for what I want to be and gratitude for what I am. Let me put something to you. One of my podcast guests this is going back to early mid last year. His name is Mike House. And he suggested 
two other elements to the nature versus nurture question, which I found interesting, and I'll put them to you to see what you think, that on top of whether you're born in with the traits of leadership or, or they're developed, two, the two other elements that Mike identified and, and that leadership is a choice, you choose to be a leader, you choose not to be a leader, and that hopefully those that are making that choice have a lifelong learning mindset when, they're, when you're talking about this, whether leaders are born or whether they're made. And in that context, context do you have a view there do you think that the the more effective leaders more effective entrepreneurs are lifelong learners in whatever field they are definitely i think as soon as you think you know everything you will struggle in life yep we only know what we know we don't know what we don't know yet every book i read i learn something new every time i re-examine a thought i think i thought before i can find a flaw in it unless you're continually turning it over turning it over turning it over as soon as you think you've you've got it nailed, I think we're all screwed. I think it, it's a 50-50 split for me. I, I can I can be convinced more than ever that you can make a leader, you can develop them, you can help them, and that, yes. uh, you know, assuming they want to help themselves to be leaders too. I'm making assumptions here that the person wants this as their their career pathway, not necessarily something everybody wants. But then you meet those people in life that have got got some of those tools are innately part of their character and it just makes for effective leadership and they didn't have to be trained in it. They've just got whatever those capabilities are. But uh, to say for me, to say it's all of one or all of the other is, mm -hmm. is to not recognize that there, there is potentially a, a bit of a spectrum, exactly right. a bit of a spectrum there. That, that's just just my view of it. But I'm I'm happy you shared uh, yours. I, I think it's interesting and it's it's pretty consistent with what most of my guests have been saying to me. Libby, just to go back to something you were saying at the start about trying to understand human behaviour, and and you've made this point a couple of times that leadership is not management. Management's about things, about processes. Yes. Leadership operations. Leadership is about inspiring, getting getting people to get on board with the whatever the narrative might be. As a student, as a practitioner, as a someone who seems to me to be fascinated with the, the with human beings, why do you think people gravitate to leadership? Is it to fill a hole in themselves, or to is it well, what what? Because I've never I've never quite asked this of my guests before, and, and this is this is new. So this Good is an, I like this. This is I a new this is, on, a new this is a new question <laughs> for me. Is what do you think in the DNA of leaders is that triggers something in them to want this? Because I can tell you from not just experience, but from people I've interviewed that it can be a bastard of a process to be a leader in some industries. It's thankless. Very much. It's a lonely yeah. road or as lonely yeah. as you want to make it, it can lead to decisions that will impact on the material life of yeah. other people. And, Massively. Um, yeah. you know, if you're in the surgical medical field, it can lead to life and death decision making. Yeah. Why? Why would people want to be this? People only do things for two reasons. That is it. They're either doing it to escape pain or to gain pleasure. There is a list of pains that we want to get away from that we currently have that we desperately want to shed. We call this the escape to arrival model. There's a list of desires that people want to arrive at that they don't currently have. Feelings that they think they'll feel a certain way when they get there. We are biochemical creatures. When we think a thought, it's really basic. Biochemically, when you think a thought or feel an emotion, we get a flood of a biochemical reaction that releases a cascade of chemicals. That's how innate thought, immaterial thoughts become matter. This Zoom call we're on was once a thought in somebody's head. Somebody had a concept. You know, the bookshelves behind you are held together by screws and nails. That was a thought. That was a concept. They became matter when somebody thought them deeply enough to work out the how. So we look at our business cycle, those questions that we talked about earlier, the what, the who, the when and the where, and the how, or how we make something into reality. Now, for somebody to make their journey and in leadership into a reality they have to want it enough they've got to have a strong enough why and that's because they're trying to escape pain or they're trying to gain pleasure it's as simple as that so the pains are something like we've, we've all got these six human needs we've all got these base things that drive us there is one of those needs which is significance significance is one of those things which drives a lot of people the desire for significance the need for a badge the want to be seen to be doing something there's also a need for connection some people have this real desire to connect with others leadership is a very deep form of connection 
there's also a, a, a need to grow. Some people do it because they want the growth associated to it. Others do it because it's their way of contributing. So there's different drivers, there's different emotional drivers that, that are doing that pull. The push, the moving away from, is usually the, the thing that creates the initial impetus. But the pull, like we talked about magnetism earlier, that attraction force, when we can dial up our attraction to our outcome, that's when we become super effective in life. We need to leverage the pain that makes us start to move and then maximize the pleasure that really creates sustainable change. So it's this balance, this foot of desire and gratitude for what you've got. Go back to a younger version of yourself. What, what would you say that you need potentially to be more effective in, in the leadership game? See, now I do this every year, Eric. I literally have just done this with my mastermind. We do a, a getting your older self to talk to your younger self. And it's really cool because it, it unites the two parts of the brain, which normally get in our own way. And this, this congruence is really important to be aware of where you've come from and be grateful i said earlier about this one foot in desire one foot in gratitude piece you've got to be grateful for who got you here they're not perfect so i do all of my podcasting through zoom and every time i ask this question people light up and go oh wow what would i say to myself and it's like you go to a happy place when you're thinking yep. about that yep. and can you give me some explanation as to why I that is the, i can give you the geeky answer yeah of course it's great. because yeah it's because we've got because in our brain what we do is we forget this gratitude piece we do the desire really well and we are striving beings we've got a large part of our brain that runs on dopamine dopamine is the achievement drug so we've got our saber tooth tiger brain that we talked about earlier that's our hypothalamic pituitary axis that floods us with cortisol floods you with adrenaline that's designed to make you move that's your anxiety system threat disgust shame anger anxiety all of those are designed to get you to a place of safety then we've got our dopaminergic system which is all about achievement all about striving this motivational you know i must win i must win the trouble is the kicker if you get stuck in that and you forget to be grateful for your steps along the way it becomes very dull we cannot live just on desire we cannot live just on striving if you don't enjoy the journey the end isn't worth it you must enjoy the journey you've got to enjoy your steps along the path and so this rooted in intentionality piece is one that i teach all the people i work with everybody that i coach gets drills on this you must live in gratitude and that means gracefully thanking that person that got you where you are so what i always say to my past self is thank you for your fault thank you for what you didn't do right because you've learned thank you for what you've learned since then and thank you for everything you did that got me here because without you I wouldn't be who I am today and it's the pain that makes the pearl you know whatever you grow you've whatever has happened for you in your life hasn't happened to you it's happened for you it's given you the gift of some wisdom wisdom is lived experience so I am intensely grateful for that idiotic geeky 20 year old who made so many wrong steps but put my feet on the path to where I am today because I wouldn't be who I was without that and that that's the beauty of this let me thank you for that and before we go could you please for the sake of the listeners give us a bit of a sense of the the services that you provide and how people can maybe get in touch with you. I would love to work with anyone listening to this, Eric. I love your podcast. I was listening. Oh, thank you. Cheers. Today. It's really cool. But anyone that's interested in this stuff is already on their path to evolving. They're already on their path to, you know, being a better version of themselves. I love action takers. I love people that take action. I love people that don't just sit there talking about it, but actually go out and do it. If anyone wants to come towards me, I'm here. I'm going to do a lovely little discount for anybody that references Eric and comes at me on email so that's just libby at concaron.com drop me an email if you want your own profile you get a 32 page report on what are your strengths what are your challenges how to build the perfect leadership team around you the 32 page report comes with an hour with me as well unpacking it one-to-one -one. and i can really do a deep i've built businesses in that hour with people before we can do a really deep dive into what is it that you need to be aware of how do you talk to people who are not like you if you ever had that phrase come up where it's not what you said it's how you say it yeah that's because you're talking across grid to somebody that's not of the same neurology as you so it's how to be better understood so i'm really happy to do a nice little discount on that for anyone that comes at me from eric podcast and it's just kemkaron.com which is my ridiculous surname with a dot and a com at the end i appreciate your time thank you for for chatting with me and uh if i could be so bold love to come back and follow up on some other sure. leadership topic areas because I'm, I'm what i'm finding and and you've helped me to solidify this in my own thinking is that there is more to the topic than I'm 
I've ever thought of and that there's more avenues to understanding leadership that I think need discussion. And the the thing that drives me about doing the podcast is it's the podcast is not about my view of leadership. It's about my guests. And I'm hoping that people listening to you either agree, vehemently disagree or somewhere in the middle and want to keep having the discussion because this is the only way we progress thinking on any of this stuff. And the more I'm seeing the networks out there and, and people like yourself and others that are on LinkedIn and engaging with the world, you're asking some questions. And for those that want to engage, they'll engage. If they don't, it's not so much to name and shame. It's more, these are things that if you're not coming to grips with now will come and haunt you later because other people that are your subordinates that you're leading, they're going to be asking these questions. And when you're stuck for the answer, the, this this idea that there's a great resignation wave happening and people are moving and looking for other options. If people don't have a reason to stay, they're going to go. And we're seeing this a lot at the moment. And that's that's a whole another area of discussion that I, I, I think you might be keen to have a chat with me on. And oh, I'd love to follow up with you, mate. Well, I'm very flattered. Thank you so much for having me. And it's been a real delight talking to you because your, your thoughts on this are so evolved because you've been talking about this for quite a while, obviously. And it's lovely to have this conversation with you. So thanks. Uh, it's, it's rare that someone says my thinking's evolved. So I appreciate the, appreciate the commentary. For those listening, I've been speaking to Dr. Libby Kim Karen. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much for having me. It's been a real delight. And for those listening, this has been Talking Leadership. We'll catch you all on the next podcast.